Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on uh, Chapter 1 of Kathy Schwalbe's An Introduction to Project Management 7th Edition. Um, chapter 1 is An Introduction to Project Program and Portfolio Management. Um, the learning objectives for the chapter are important, but I'm going to leave those for you folks to read on your own. A couple of slides of those. And um, in our weekly schedule, you should always uh, uh, be able to find a copy of the slides uh, pretty close to um, the link where you found this recording for the lecture. So uh, we begin with this introduction in which we're trying to um, answer the question, uh, why learn project management? Why is it important? And uh, there's a couple of interesting uh, points uh, here. Um, project managers and project management are in high demand in the workplace. And um, uh, people in the workplace are organizing their work as projects to the extent that the amount of work that's organized that way is expected to reach $34.5 trillion in cost by 2030. And they're expecting that employers are going to need 25 million new individuals uh, working in project management oriented roles by 2030. So um, there's a lot of demand. Okay. Um, there's an important uh, contribution as well in 2020 when we had to deal with the with the COVID pandemic. Uh, most organizations needed to change the way that they operated. And um, the best way to organize uh, changes in your operations is to create a project to do that. And people did that and they did very well. Um, so I think that when people are thinking of projects that were uh, put together in a hurry and had a big impact, uh, they think about those uh, projects from 2020. And uh, good project management helps the bottom line. An average 11.4% of investment is wasted due to poor project performance. And this is really just the other side of some of the things that we were saying uh, further up the slide where um, if we're going to organize a lot of the work that we do in the workplace as a project, then how well we do that um, is going to have a big impact on what the cost is, right? And um, they're saying that the range that you could expect between doing a good job and a bad job is uh, maybe pretty close to 12% of the cost. And if the cost is $34.5 trillion, 12% of that is a lot of money. Um, why would people like you want to study project management? Well, um, salaries for project managers are high. Uh, they mentioned that there was an average in uh, 2019 of $124,000, and certainly that's uh, good money. Uh, certification, which we're going to talk about within the chapter, is a good investment because when they did the survey mentioned above, um, people who had a... Uh, PMP certification from the PMI organization um, had salaries that were 22% higher on average than those who didn't have it. 
And uh, project management is also a vital skill for personal success. I guess so, because uh, um, um, well, because of all the things we just really uh, talked about. Um, I think we personally want to be part of all the successful parts of um, the things we've said in the last couple of minutes. So there's a very famous study by this uh, consulting firm called the Standish Group. And they did a study in 1995, which is now uh, getting fairly old. Let's see, 1995 is not 30 years ago, but um, uh, it's getting close, right? And um, uh, they did a, a report that they called the CHAOS report, where uh, CHAOS was some kind of acronym. But the implication was the state of project management in IT was uh, bad. And so chaos was kind of a pejorative uh, term. And they found that only 16.2% of IT projects uh, were successful in meeting sc scope time and cost goals. Um, and over 31% of the projects were canceled before a completion. Now, uh, later on in the course, I'm going to talk about why canceling projects before completion is not always a bad thing, okay? Sometimes we want to try things, and then we learn as we're doing them that they weren't as promising as we thought, in which case, um, instead of uh, trying to ride a, a sick or dead horse all the way to its conclusion, um, we're expected to uh, cancel these things and to move on to other opportunities. So um, that only uh, that uh, about a third of projects were canceled before completion. I'm not sure that that's horrible news. I mean, we would expect it to be a quarter or an eighth at least. Um, maybe a third is high. And in 2019, uh, uh, KPMG, a uh, management consulting firm, and a couple of project management uh, certification agencies, they found that only 19% of organizations delivered successful projects defined as meeting scope, uh, time, costs, and stakeholder satisfaction. Uh, goals most of the time. Okay, so maybe in 2019 they were saying that we're still uh, challenged. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in managing IT projects. And uh, here, here at the iSchool, um, we have people to come that come to my project management uh, class. And they're all interested in information projects, but um, maybe not all interested in IT projects. So what are the advantages of using formal project management, which is essentially what this course is about? So the claims are that we'll have better control of physical and human resources, uh, improved customer relations, shorter development uh, times, lower costs, higher quality and increased reliability, higher profit margins, improved productivity, better internal coordination, and higher worker morale. And the implication of that last one is that's both the morale of the people who are working on the project and the morale of the people in the organization who have to consume whatever the product is that the project is going to uh, create, okay? And um, it's really up to us as we're learning about formal project management to prove our case that these things are true, okay? These are our claims here early on. And um, 
throughout the course, we're going to be uh, showing you things and talking about things that are more evidence for these uh, claims. So before we get too deep into this, it's important to really uh, define what a project is because um, uh, people use the term fairly loosely. But when not used loosely, a project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Temporary is, is an interesting thing, okay? So in uh, project management uh, uh, training like this, we like to distinguish between projects and continuing operations. So uh, a continuing operation is, uh, continuing operations are work that's done to, to, to sustain the business, okay? And you can think of it like this. A continuing operations are the organization just kind of operating in its standard mode, okay? And then from time to time, the people who lead the organization realize that there are uh, benefits uh, to be had from changing that standard mode. So they organize a project and the project uh, is a temporary endeavor. And at the end of the project, um, the project team hands over the result, the product or service or other result, to operations. And then operations incorporates them into the way they do the business, okay? And that's the end of the project, but then um, the results of the project are uh, subsumed, eaten, <laughs> incorporated into continuing operations. So projects end when it, 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 their objectives have been reached or the project has been uh, terminated. And I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, terminating a project is not always a bad thing. I mean, if you're on the project, it's kind of a downer, right? Um, because you bought into the project being a good thing to do and you promoted it. And if the organization uh, decides they're not going to see it through to the conclusion, well, it's a disappointment. But in terms of the health of the organization, if every project that you pick goes all the way to the end, um, and you never terminate one for having turned out in a, a, a disappointing way, then you're probably not taking enough uh, 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 chances on things. You know, we ought to pick enough, you know, kind of mm, uncertain or marginal or speculative opportunities that we would expect some projects to be terminated before their uh, uh, conclusion. Okay, not always a bad thing, although it can be disappointing. So what would be some examples of projects? So here's a whole page of examples of projects, and I'm just going to pick a couple to talk about here, and you can read the rest on your own. So a young uh, couple hires the firm to design and build them a new house. Okay. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a school district upgrades its technology infrastructure to provide wireless internet access for all students in school and from home. Okay, that sounds kind of cool. And again, before the project, well, uh, people didn't have this uh, capability or maybe they had wireless access of their own in their homes and that kind of stuff. Um, so the continuing operations either had no wireless or a little wireless that was um, uh, not associated with the school district. And then they did the project and they turned it over to continuing operation. Now everybody has it both uh, at school and at home. 
Um, and then the last one I'll mention is a pharmaceutical a company launches a new drug or vaccine. So um, most product introductions are organized as projects. Okay. And uh, I think what's really interesting when you think of them as uh, projects is um, they are interesting in the following way. Uh, coming up with a new product has a, a creative side. Okay. Um, and yet, uh, uh, once you get past the creative uh, part, well, then, um, especially if you're a pharmaceutical uh, company, you have to make sure that you, um, you do every little part that's expected of a pharmaceutical uh, company in uh, 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 creating and uh, manage, manufacturing a new drug or uh, a vaccine, okay? So um, this slide points you to a video um, in which the Project Management Institute, which is, I think, a great organization that I've been associated with for, oh, probably 20 years now, um, they give a Project of the Year award, okay? And if we click through here, uh, we can see some things about that award. And we have three instances of organizations that won the award. In 2020, the Trans-Anatolian Natural Gas uh, Pipeline uh, uh, Project uh, won. In 2019, the Embraer E190 E2 program uh, uh, development one uh, that was uh, uh, a series of uh, oh, that is either one airplane or a uh, family of them. And in 2018, um, the Southeast Louisiana Veterans Healthcare System replacement one. And uh, replace, replacing an existing information system is a pretty challenging thing to do. Okay, so um, uh, PMI uh, is a promoter of formal project management, uh, knowledge and practice and ethics and tools and techniques. They're not only interested in IT projects, and as you can see, this award uh, went to a gas pipeline, which I'm sure had some IT uh, component, but it was a pipeline, an aerospace uh, project. And then the 2018 one was uh, clearly an IT uh, project. Okay, and so the general belief is that while IT projects have some unique uh, characteristics, that uh, those of us who do IT projects like me and perhaps you, that we ought to keep them in mind, that the standard principles of project management have a lot to offer to all industries. There's also a link here to a video on the, the history of uh, uh, project management. There's a link to one that has music only. There's a link to the one that has a commentary by the author. And um, I, think it, I think this is interesting stuff to play, especially the one that includes the comments by the author. It's, um, I think it's pretty common for especially maybe IT folks of uh, today, to think the world started in about the year uh, 2000. Um, but uh, people have been uh, managing projects a long time. And 
even in terms of you, you kind of modern things that people do for project management, a lot of them got their start in the logistical things that were done for World War II. And World War II was over in 1945. So that's not quite 80 years ago. So uh, the history of project management is longer than you think. So this is, uh, this is worth a play. OK. So let's talk about some attributes of a project. They're interesting to understand because um, I think when we understand them, then it makes it easier, easier for us to manage them. So we say that a, a project has a unique uh, purpose, OK? That's not to say that we might not do a lot of similar projects, OK? There has to be some uh, detail that's going to be different, or we wouldn't do the project. We would just take whatever the product was of the last one, and we would use it, OK? So maybe it's for a new client, it's for a new product, it's for a different geographic s s segment, something like that. But um, uh, in order for us to dedicate the resources, there has to be a uniqueness uh, to it. Although, although you can have a whole series of related uh, projects that are very similar, and you can exploit that. Um, as we said before, it's temporary, okay? So projects don't go on forever. One, um, one kind of hint that you don't have a project at hand is that it's, it doesn't end, okay? There's no plan to end it. Well, maybe it's not a project. Maybe it's a new business, okay? And uh, maybe the beginning is the proper uh, project, but then we're going to turn it over to a group of people. They may even be the same people who are on the project, but they're going to operate it indefinitely. Well, as soon as you get to that point, you're doing a continuing operation. It drives change and it enables value creation. And uh, this kind of gets back uh, to the distinction between uh, continuing operations and uh, projects. Um, if there wasn't going to be change that was going to create more value, then we would never do the project. We would just continuing uh, continue to do our uh, continuing operations. And it's probably true that we can make modest uh, changes and continuing operations without having to form up a project. Um, you know, we might get together uh, in a weekly meeting and say, uh, we're going to be doing things slightly differing, uh, different from here on in. Um, you know, you don't need a project to do everything. You've got to have something of some import to kind of organize it as a project. Uh, projects are developed using progressive elaboration or an iterative uh, fashion. And these are both interesting. Progressive elaboration is um, a phrase, it's been around project management for some time. And it's part of the thinking that went into uh, traditional or predictive or waterfall uh, kinds of projects. The idea was that we wouldn't just expect to uh, build the product. We would expect to have these uh, kind of versions. Uh, you know, we would have an expression of the scope of the project. And then we would have a more detailed expression of the scope of the project. So we would have, you know, sketches before we would have full uh, paintings, right? So that um, over time, we would get more details about what we were going to do in the project. That's progressive elaboration. We just don't go and build out even the full plan without having um, 
more concise versions of it, making sure we're all on board at every stage. Uh, the iterative uh, fashion is really coming from agile project management. And the idea there is, you know, the, the most uh, uh, popular version of agile is this um, uh, approach called scrum, where we do some lightweight planning up front in order to get some idea of the scope of what we're going to do. And then we have these sprints, uh, typically one to four weeks long. I like the two-week uh, version, in which we take the things off the list of uh, kind of um, features that are within the scope. And we commit to, OK, we're going to build uh, uh, the first two and then we build those and we get some feedback and then we do sprint two and then we pick say three things and we build three more. Okay, that's what, what we mean by iterative. Uh, it requires resources from various areas. Okay, and by resources we mean people, money, uh, office space, computers, um, operating systems, software, uh, airplane flights, uh, meals and hotel rooms, all those kinds of things. Uh, it should have a primary customer or sponsor. So the project sponsor usually provides the direction and funding for the project. And this is uh, kind of uh, baked into the way um, the way we do business, uh, certainly here in the U.S., the people who pay for things are expected to get a greater say um, in what gets uh, produced, okay? Now, that's not to say that uh, projects always create a product or service or a deliverable for one uh, customer. But in most organizations, um, the, the person who um, is going to get, mo their organization is going to get most of the benefits. Uh, they get elected be, to be the project sponsor. Um, their organization is probably going to be charged for most of the cost. And if they do a good job, they not only represent their own direct interests, but um, the interest of other stakeholders within the company. Right? And it's usually pretty good uh, practice when you're a project manager um, to look for to the project sponsor uh, to either make the decisions or to apply pressure to the parties who need to make the uh, uh, decisions. And this is kind of the general idea that power is kind of hierarchical and it flows from the top and money does the same thing. And perhaps that's kind of old school thinking, but um, it's useful. And projects involve uncertainty. And uh, that's pretty important stuff because a lot of managing projects is not coming up with a plan that's going to be perfect, right? A lot, we can't know what we don't know, okay? So what we need to do is, um, is to predict right? What's going to happen? You know, we predict what we're going to need and uh, all those uh, kinds of things. And we come up with, uh, with a plan. We realize that there's uncertainty and there are risks. And then we manage that over time. Okay. Um, so if there's no uncertainty, then um, probably it's not a very interesting uh, uh, project. So project managers work with the sponsors, the project team, and the other people involved in the project to define, communicate, and meet project goals. Uh, 
Um, well, this sounds like a happy um, activity until you realize that there are constraints. Okay, so every project is constrained in different ways. Some project managers think it's useful to focus on what they call the triple a constraint, meaning time, scope, and costs. Okay, um, and this is a really useful thing to think of. This is uh, this has been a popular idea in formal project management for certainly 30, 40 years, and it's a, a good thing to think of. So what's the scope? Well, the scope is what work is going to be done as part of the project. What unique product, service, or result does a customer or sponsor expect from the project? And what's included and what's excluded? Okay. A lot of times in the beginning of the project, there's a lot of talk, you know, kind of general talk. Well, maybe we'll do X, Y, and Z. And some people will say stuff like, well, yeah, that would be great, but we don't have the money for X, Y, and Z. I think we only should do X and Y. And then uh, perhaps yet another person will say, I would love X and Y, but the fact is we can only afford X and we only have the time for X, okay? So uh, deciding about what we want to do and then how we want to constrain the scope in order to make sure that we can get the project done, um, that can be pretty challenging. And so then we've got time. How long should it take to complete the project? What's the timeline? And of course, the bigger the scope, the longer the time, okay? And then we have the cost. What should it cost to complete the project? What's the project's budget? What resources are going to be needed? Because you might have the time and you might have the budget, but you don't have the resources. Let's say you need people with certain skills and you just don't have them, right? Now, um, the triple uh, the constraint uh, has... Um, has the following kind of um, interesting relationship. Uh, most people believe that you can trade them off against each other, okay? So um, some people, uh, it, here's how I like, to, I like to describe it. These things are interlinked with each other, right? If you increase the scope, then the time and the cost are going to go up because you're going to do more, okay? Uh, if you decrease the cost, okay, what you're going to pay, well, then you're going to have to either uh, uh, reduce the scope or increase the time or do both, right? And I like to think of this as kind of a whack-a-mole game, okay? Uh, whereas you as a project manager, you're advising the, the sponsor and the key st stakeholders. And um, you're trying to come up with a formula for scope and time and cost that everybody can subscribe to. And the unfortunate thing is that when you when you clobber one of the moles, say uh, time, uh, one or both of the others will pop up, and you go, oh, now I have to do something with scope, and then you do something with scope, and then you go, oh, now the cost is wrong, right? So uh, the idea is that we trade these things off in consultation with our sponsor and other stakeholders um, until we get a combination for scope and time and cost that are uh, that people can subscribe to, right? So the interrelation of these things and the ability to trade them off against each other is all kind of embodied in this uh, phrase triple uh, uh, constraints. Now, we have other constraints uh, too, uh, quality and risk and resources. And um, 
we'll be learning about all those things, and they're certainly important to the project manager, which I'm going to begin to call the PM. Okay, so the PM is certainly interested in quality and risk and resources. Um, and potentially, you would think that you could trade those off too. But the fact is that most thoughtful people think, especially for quality and risk, um, that it's a bad idea to trade them off. Okay, with respect to scope and time and cost, you can trade them off. It's just a matter of what you're, um, it's like ordering from the menu, you know. Am I going to get the big a uh, burger and I'm not going to get the shake? Or am I going to get the shake and a smaller burger, right? All those things are okay to trade off against each other. But in most organizations, we have an idea about the kind of quality that we have. And we don't want to be trading it off in order to say, uh, meet the time goal. If, if we meet the time goal by reducing uh, quality, most people think that that's a failure right out of the blocks. Uh, risk as well. If, in fact, we come up with a combination of scope and time and cost that uh, can succeed, but it's highly risky, well, then maybe that's not consistent with the taste for risk that our organization has. Okay? And resources are kind of different resources are typically are kind of uh fixed you kind of have the people that you have okay if you're thinking in terms of human resources okay so this uh triple constraint trading things off whack-a-mole idea is typically limited to scope and time and cost and it can be very uh powerful Right. For instance, the project manager can be talking to the stakeholders and they'll say something like, um, we're running out of time. OK, we've got to find a way to get the time down. And the project manager gets put in the the uh, the position where uh, she can say, OK, well, uh, the easiest way for us to do that is to reduce the scope. Okay, so we would take some things out of the project. We might do them in a subsequent uh, project or a phase, but if we need to meet the time, given the experience that we have now, then we're going to have to reduce the scope. So is there something that you'd be willing to part with, right? So this can be very powerful thinking, and it can keep the stakeholders in the driver's uh, seat, right? And it can keep the responsibility on not just the project manager and the project team who's going to produce the project, but the rest of the stakeholders as well can take ownership for the trading off that goes into the triple constraint. Um, so here on the next slide, they're essentially saying that we've got a project and we have all these uh, constraints and we kind of said that uh, before and I, I think what is interesting is um, you can trade all these things off against each other but the three things that I think can be responsibly traded off are scope and time and uh, cost. Um, so we keep trying to get back to kind of uh, definitions of things and those that we're using we're taking from the project management institute um, which uh, is an organization that i have a lot of regard for so they say the project management is the application of knowledge skills tools and techniques to project activities to meet the requirements and why is this important to know? Well, we're going to go through the knowledge, the skills, the tools, and the techniques. And so having a definition like this uh, kind of drives us in the direction of those things. Um, so this, this uh, uh, diagram that we're looking at here 
this was uh, PMI's uh, primary way of explaining um, the the information, you know, the knowledge and the organization that needed to be brought to projects uh, up until uh, three, four years ago, okay? And they said that when you looked at uh, project management, you could look at the knowledge areas, and they've got uh, 10 of them here, integration, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resource, communication, risk, procurement, stakeholder, engagement, right? Or you could also look at all project management in another way, and you could say there's always some process going on within the project that you're managing. And they identified five process groups, initiating the project, planning the project, executing the project, monitoring and controlling the project, and closing the project. OK, so uh, these two um, these two schemes for looking at all of project management are overlapping. OK, They're, they are faceted ways to classify what goes on in projects. You can think, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing the such and such. Which process group is that part of? OK, or you could say, oh, I'm doing uh, this other thing. Which knowledge area or areas am I pulling from? OK, and uh, this is a way to take a pretty big uh, body of knowledge and organize it, okay? So they organized it in two different ways. And um, there are even uh, tables, right? So you can take these two facets and you can take, uh, you can take them and combine them. And you can say, well, I could come up with a table with uh, five times 10 cells in it. So you could take any particular thing and you can put it in one of the 50 cells, okay? And there were some people who were teaching project management who thought that was a useful thing to do. And you can find those kind of tables around in the PMI literature. Now, in the past couple of years, they've come up with a new version of their, um, of their, uh, kind of foundational uh, document. It's called the PM Bach Project Management Body of Knowledge. And the most recent one um, includes a talk about the five process uh, groups and the 10 knowledge areas, but they've added a couple of more things. Okay. Um, and did we get there yet? No, no, we didn't get there yet. So I'm going to explain some of the more details of uh, uh, probably the knowledge areas. Let's look. So one of the knowledge areas is stakeholders. OK, so stakeholders are the people involved or affected by project activities. Stakeholders include the project sponsor. A uh, project sponsor is maybe a stakeholder with special, who deserves special care because they're probably paying the bills. Uh, the project manager, that would be us, the project team, support staff, customers uh, of the organization, suppliers of the organization. And one, one surprising thing to me when I learned all this stuff is it even includes opponents to the project. Well, why opponents to the project? Well, they could have a big impact on the project. You know, we don't want to go through life with rose-colored glasses. So um, if we're going to manage stakeholders, we have to be interested in everybody. And stakeholder management, one big aspect of it is making sure that you discover all the interested uh, parties and involve them uh, in the project early on. Because when you don't and you discover them later, and they always tend to show up, um, one, you haven't been uh, considering their needs or their power or their influence. 
But the other thing is that they're angry when you find them late. Okay. And then um, they're probably, uh, no matter what other category they fit into, they may uh, just in terms of their their feelings be opponents to the project. They said, you know, this is a project that hasn't been considering me. Uh, project management knowledge area. So project integration management is the overarching function that coordinates the work of all the other knowledge areas. It affects and is affected by all the other knowledge areas. So I like to call that the secret sauce right? You have these nine other knowledge areas, and then how do you trade them off and integrate them together and turn them into things that you're going to do? Well, we put that into project integration management. Project scope management involves working with all the stakeholders to define, gain written agreement for, and manage all the work required to project uh, uh, to complete the project successfully that includes both what's in and what's out okay i um recently uh, decided to get a poster that i'm going to be hanging on my wall both at my home office here and that my office at the high school and it's a quote from Robert Browning, actually, first. But it was a, a phrase uh, used all the time by the architect Mies van der Rohe. And the phrase is, less is more. And um, there's, there's a lot to be said for keeping things out of a project. Uh, project time management includes estimating how long it will take to complete the work, developing an acceptable project schedule given cost-effective use of available resources, and ensuring timely completion of the project. Um, uh, that's uh, time management. Project cost management consists of preparing and managing the budget for the project. Project quality management ensures that the project will satisfy the stated or implied needs for which it was undertaken. And in kind of implicit here, every organization has a kind of quality perspective and point of view. And if you don't hit it with your project, um, you're bums, okay? Uh, project resource management is concerned with making effective use of the people and physical resources needed for the project. Communications management involves it generating, collecting, disseminating, and storing project information. Uh, project risk management includes identifying, analyzing, and responding to risk related to the project. Project risk management um, is something that not everybody thinks of, but um, uh, you know the PMI approach to project risk management is do a really good job of identifying up front what all the potential risks are, and um, having a plan uh, for reacting to them in the appropriate way, and um, it turns out that that can really improve your outcomes. Project procurement management involves acquiring or pe procuring goods and services for a project from outside the performing organiza organization. Uh, project stakeholder management focuses on identifying project stakeholders, understanding their needs and expectations, and engaging them appropriately throughout the project. Okay, and that's, again, when you think of these as the knowledge areas, it's pretty comprehensive, right? If you, you can think of some part of what you need to know, know to manage a project, you can pro probably plunk it into one of those 10 knowledge areas, which is why it's one of the, the facets or uh, dimensions, the knowledge area uh, facet is one of the ways that we try to uh, categorize uh, project management stuff. 
Uh, project management tools and techniques. So um, while we're doing project management, we have tools and techniques um, that we use, okay? Um, so we use these uh, to assist project managers and their teams in various aspects of project management. Note that tools or techniques is more than just a software uh, package, okay? So tools and techniques are typically described in terms of ways of organizing information, okay? And uh, could you embody that in some software package? Yes, you could. Uh, and we, we often do. Uh, do we have to do it with a particular software package or, you know, could we do it on paper? Could we do it on, uh, in ledger books? Well, in my early days of project management, when we didn't have all these uh, uh, software tools, we certainly uh, did a lot of these things on, uh, on paper. So here are some of the tools that are, are will be talked about in the course. Uh, ones that deal with sc scope include project charters, scope this statement, and this thing called the WBS, which stands for Work Breakdown Structure. And then for time, we have Gantt charts, network uh, uh, diagrams, and we have uh, critical path analyses. For costs, we have net present value, we have cost estimates, and we have an approach uh, called earned value management, EVM. And then on the Agile side, uh, um, Agile is an approach in which the proponents maybe don't believe in all of the tools and techniques that I described uh, above uh, for scope and time and cost. And yet they do believe in tools and techniques, okay? So they have, uh, if you're taking the Scrum approach to Agile, okay, which is the one that we go through here, they have product road maps, they have backlogs, they have burn down charts, they have meetings that they call retrospectives. So they have tools and techniques uh, too. They may claim to be lightweight, they may claim to be less planning and intensive, and a lot of those claims I, I think hold up. But uh, uh, it's saying that they have lightweight planning and tools and techniques is not the claim that they have no planning and tools and techniques. Um, how do you define project success? Well, several different ways, okay? Um, uh, if the project provides value, the value is the worth or the importance or usefulness of uh, 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 something. So um, typically we'll undertake a project if uh, in the organization we have a problem that we want to solve or an opportunity that we want to, uh, uh, to capitalize upon. So the value is some or all of the problems solved or some or all of the opportunity capitalized. Uh, another way to look at project success is the project met scope, time, and cost uh, goals. But you can imagine that a project could meet scope, time, and cost uh, goals, but somehow the value eluded the project, right? So scope, time, and cost uh, uh, goals on their own are important, but if you're not you're not generating perceived value or expected value, then you're at a loss. At the same time, you could achieve the value and just kind of overrun the time and cost of a goals in some unconscionable way. Um, and uh, maybe that would not be considered a success. And uh, one thing here, the project satisfied the customer 
and or the sponsor. So happy people at the end of the project. Ideally, we have all three. Ideally, we have a tangible value that we can point to. Uh, we have reasonable performance on the scope, the time, and the cost. And then the customer and the sponsor are happy. They'd like us to do another project for them. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the ideal outcome. One method to measure customer satisfaction is net promoter score. This is fairly new a number that represents the customer's willingness to recommend a product or service to others. So that, I think, is a way to kind of operationalize how satisfied the customer or sponsor is, right? If you really want to measure it, well, how do you measure it? Well, how willing are they to recommend us to... Uh, it depends on who we are. If we're like an internal provider, how how ready are they to you know to recommend us to other departments? If we're an external uh, provider, how willing are they to recommend us uh, to other clients? Uh, and then the last thing, the project produced the desired results. And I, I think that and value and worth. That's the tangible side of the value and worth. Um, so, uh, Kathy Schwabe likes to do these things about what went right and what went wrong. So, in terms of what went right, uh, improved project performance. So, um, you know, the study that we talked about earlier is the Standish one. It's from 1995. Uh, it had pretty bleak things to say, okay? Now, you have to remember that 1995 was the beginning of internet applications. It was the beginning of, you know, internet startups. It was a pretty chaotic time, okay? And a lot of those things just uh, died. People thought it was a way to get rich. They threw a lot of money. People weren't really all that organized into formal approaches to things. So 1994 was the Wild West, right? So you would think that things would get better over time simply because a lot of the people who went at this in the wrong way just died. Okay, so you would expect improvement even if we did nothing at, at all, okay? But um, what we're trying to talk about here is that there's been a lot of interest in formal project management since that time. And we think some of the improvement that we're seeing in these IT projects are the result of uh, increased focus on uh, formal approaches to project management. And when we're saying that, we're not only saying the traditional or waterfall approach, but uh, 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 traditional and agile as uh, well. So let's see, the number of successful projects has increased from 16% in 94 to 29% in 2015. So that's an improvement. The number of failed projects decreased from 31% to 19%. 62% uh, of small projects were successful in 2011 to 2015. And 39% of all Agile projects were successful compared to 11% of waterfall projects. Um, so that... Uh, uh, it turns out that these Agile projects, Kathy uh, uh, Schwabe uh, discusses in the chapter, uh, uh, it, 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 stakeholders have a, a very favorable impression of Agile projects, which is why we see it getting used a lot. Um, So what we see here is the new way that a PMI is organizing 
information about good project management uh, in their latest edition of the PMBOK, PMBOK being the project management body of knowledge. So it's called the PMBOK uh, guide. So the seventh edition is the most recent one, which they came out in 21, so it's only two years old, okay? Uh, now, does PMI think that project management has uh, changed? Uh, well, it's changed some. Everything changes uh, some. Do they think that the old scheme that they had for organizing information, which had the five process groups and the 10 knowledge areas, is wrong? No, they don't. Okay. They're giving us two more um two more facets to use to organize all the stuff that we learn about project management and they're putting a lot of emphasis on these and they are uh principles of project management that's the top uh, part of the diagram and uh um uh, uh guided uh behavior uh that's uh the bottom uh, part okay so let's just expand this a bit and see what they're see what they're trying to promote here so the principles of project management that they want us to concentrate on are be diligent respect be a diligent respectful and caring steward recognize evaluate and respond to system interactions navigate complexity create a collaborative team environment, demonstrate leadership behaviors, optimize risk responses, effectively engage with stakeholders, tailor your project management approach based upon the context of the project, embrace adaptability and resiliency, focus on value, build quality into processes and deliverables, enable change to achieve the envisioned future state okay now so if you go and you buy the pm bach guide seventh edition you're going to find this a diagram in there and you're going to find a, um, a talk about it throughout the guide and if you went on and you uh, decided that you wanted to take one of the certification exams you would find more talk of things like these principles of project management uh, in the questions that would be on the exam okay uh, but it's it's a new facet of classifying what we know about project management it's not that the old two facets were wrong this is the third facet okay and this is the fourth one uh the uh behavior okay so we have these uh project performance uh, uh domains okay which are the behavior that goes on and these are, are the things that we want to promote uh good practices in okay so stakeholders managing the team uh uh, 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 development approach and life cycle, planning, project work, delivery, measurement, uncertainty. Okay? So, again, what is this? This is the fourth facet of this now four facet classification system in which you ought to be able to place any facts that you know about what good project management is you ought to be say you ought to be able to say well where does it fit on these project performance uh, domains and maybe you just can't put it in one place maybe you have to put it in uh, two or three that's fine okay these are all just ways to take all this information about what good project management is and organize it in a way to make it more accessible to you the project manager Okay, so let's try to get, oh, I'm sorry. I uh, don't 
did this the wrong way. I'm making it uh, bigger. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, I think that's about right. Okay. Uh, so here's some of the terminology that came out of this uh, PM Box 7th edition. And again, I think you can think of this in uh, 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 two ways. Way number one that I've already emphasized. Uh, these are just other ways to help you sort this information out and make it more accessible for you. The other way is to think of if you're going to sit for one of the certification exams, you're going to expect questions to come up based upon the new terminology. So the principles for a profession serve as foundational guidelines for strategy, decision making, and problem solving. So those are the principles. A project performance domain is a group of related activities that are critical for effective delivery of project outcome. And tailoring is the deliberate adaptation of the project management approach the governance and the processes to make them more suitable for the given environment and the work at hand. Okay, so this uh, PMI approach, which is mm, the best manifestation I know of formal approaches to project management, there was never the claim that you would use all these things for every uh, uh, project. There was always this ideally, there was always this idea that you would look at your project and then you would look at all the things that you could use on it and you would pick the right ones to apply. Now, uh, tailoring is a word that they've introduced as a way to describe that, picking the right things to apply. Um, before the new version of the PM Bach, they talk about uh, um, us having tools and techniques. Okay, uh, now they've refined those terms, and they're using uh, models, methods, and ar artifacts. So, what are models, methods, and artifacts? Well, collectively, they're tools and techniques. These are just three terms that understand what tools and techniques are uh, more fully. So a model is a thinking strategy to explain a process, framework, or a phenomenon. For examples, uh, models of leadership or uh, models of change. A method is the means for achieving an outcome, output, result, or project uh, uh, deliverables. Uh, things like estimating. An artifact can be a template, a document, output, or project uh, deliverable. For example, a project charter, product backlog, uh, contract, etc. So the documents that a project throws off uh, are described in almost anthropological terms. They're called artifacts. And so when we say artifacts, we don't mean uh, part shards or uh, uh, bones, okay? We mean uh, uh, project plans, cost estimates, uh, team contract, those kinds of things. Okay, now we haven't talked about program management yet. And it, a lot of times when you're listening to people, you hear people use... Um, you hear people use language kind of loosely, okay? So what we talk about so far has been project management, how you manage a project. Now, there is such a thing as program management, uh, uh, and it's a broader activity, okay? Uh, and we don't, we try not to use them, uh, those terms interchangeably. So a program is a group of related projects. It's more than one project. Um, and program activities managed in a coordinated manner to obtain benefits not av available from managing them individually. 
Okay, so what kind of benefits? Um, a lot of times they're financial uh, benefits. If we decide to do uh, more than one project at the same time, and let's say they use uh, the same resources, well, if we consider them together, we can do that in an optimal way, okay? Um, also, uh, let's say that we're trying to create a family of products, okay? And of course, uh, if we go at the creation and, and the introduction of, say, three products independently, well, they could have a lot of overlap. They could, there could be a lot of lost opportunity there, okay? So whenever um, projects could, could benefit from coordination and we decided to consider them uh, together, uh, we can uh, talk about them collectively as a program. And if we appoint a manager to manage that, then we would call the manager a program manager. A mega project is it's a, a huge uh, project. So uh, a mega project is a project that costs over a billion US uh, dollars. So um, there's some example of mega projects here on this slide. Uh, the Panama Canal expansion, 5.25 uh, billion. Portman Bridge in Vancouver, BC, 1.92 uh, billion. Three Gorges uh, Dam in China, 22 billion. Okay, so uh, we are doing some big uh, projects in the world. Um, and uh, without uh, uh, project management, uh, these things would uh, probably have very little hope of succeeding. Uh, so here's an example uh, program, okay? We have this uh, company, ABC uh, 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 Construction, okay? And um, in this case, they've got three programs, okay? They have single family homes. So they each single family home is an individual project. But they've decided that they're going to manage the single family homes business as a program because they think there are advantages uh, there. And program two is apartment uh, buildings and program three is office uh, buildings. Right. There's a third uh, term that is important to think of. And this, this is the idea of project portfolio management, okay? And this is, what projects does the organization want to be doing, okay? So a portfolio is uh, defined as projects, programs, subsidiary portfolios, and operations managed as a group to achieve, achieve strategic objectives. What do we want to do? What does the organization want to be doing? Many organizations support an emerging business strategy of project portfolio management by continuously selecting and managing the optimum set of projects and programs to deliver maximum business value. The main distinction between project and program management and portfolio management is a focus on meeting tactical versus strategic uh, goals. Okay, so um, you can think of a bunch of uh, projects or some of those uh, uh, projects uh, collected into programs, and they all might be kind of interesting kind of tactical things for the organization to do, but if you don't think about the strategy of the organization and where it really most importantly wants to be going, then you might be putting your money and your effort and your time into projects that are not going to get you to your strategic uh, uh, goals. So this, so this issue of which projects are we going to activate and which ones are we going to hold off on um, 
is what's known as project portfolio management. Um, so project and program management address questions like, are we carrying out projects well? Are projects on time and within the budget? Do project stakeholders know what they should be doing? And then on the portfolio side, are we working on the right projects? Are we investing in the right areas? Do we have the right resources to be uh, competitive in the marketplace with our competitors? So uh, we're going to say some more about Agile. Okay. So um, in this course, uh, we're we're going to cover Agile as part of what's uh, talked about in the Swalby book, and we're also going to be covering it in terms of the Leighton uh, uh, book, uh, Agile Project Management for Dummies. And I, I think that Schwabi does, I think, a good job of putting Agile into its fair place, okay? And uh, I think that Leighton does a good job of kind of promoting Agile with all the bravado that Agile people do, okay? And it's important for you as a student to see both of those, okay? Um, and see what you believe. So what are the definitions? Let's see, the Agile Alliance uh, in 2021 defines Agile as the ability to create and respond to change. Uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary says it's marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace, like an Agile dancer. Uh, PMI's Agile Practice Guide says the term used to describe a mindset of values and principles as set forth in the Agile Manifesto. So they're uh, back up to item one. Uh, why wouldn't you manage all projects using Agile? Well, again, if you read uh, the Leighton book, uh, he's pretty much telling you that that's what you should do. And if you listen to most of the preachers who preach Agile, um, they're going to tell you that that's what you should do. Of course, it's not that simple. There were over 80 frameworks for Agile by 2021. Okay, Scrum, the most popular framework, is a lightweight framework that helps people, teams, and organizations generate value through adaptive solutions for complex problems. That sounds pretty general, doesn't it? Okay, and here's a cartoon that says uh, there are 80 competing frameworks for Agile, and somebody says, oh, you know, we need one. And then when they agree on that, well, then that becomes the 81st. So it doesn't solve the problem. It compounds it. Um, <clears throat> Agile is good stuff. Okay. Uh, it takes itself way too seriously. Okay. But the, the idea that the approaches to project management that came before it. This Agile Manifesto was written in 2001, okay? And it was really a reaction to approaches to projects and project management that were too bureaucratic, okay? And everybody was doing big design up front and they were having a lot of problems with things. So, when these people got together in uh, 2001 and said that they had another point of view, um, they really had a lot of different ideas. They really weren't the same as what everybody was thinking. They did take credit for every good idea that anybody ever had in project management. They're not shy and sort of appropriating every good idea that's been had, even if the waterfall or predictive or whatever you want to call it, people were doing it. Okay, but uh, uh, let's say they, uh, they said that they've come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Okay, and people before them were very much into processes and tools. 
working software over comprehensive uh, uh, documentation? Well, again, if you're going to take the traditional approach to uh, systems analysis and design, you're going to document the requirements and the design before you produce any software. So this was a real difference. Uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So they thought that a lot of the um, a lot of the change process in um, formal project management was too much like the contract negotiation, not enough like collaboration. Mm, I think they oversimplified it, but it's a decent uh, criticism. Responding to change over following a plan. Okay, well, uh, most people who were part of formal project management had an approach to uh, change that I think was pretty sophisticated. So um, they, I think they took a little too much uh, credit here. Uh, and then they talk about things on the right and things on the left. That had to do with the, the way they wrote this down. Okay. Um, and a note down here, you can replace the word software with products or solutions. And this is kind of true, but, you know, the real promise of the Agile approach is for software. Okay. Now, a lot of the aspects of going at the design of things in, in an iterative way, it doesn't only apply to software. It can apply to products and services and that kind of stuff. But the, you know, the real big problems and excesses that these uh, folks were responding to when they got together in uh, 2001 were happening in software projects, okay? Um, so I think that they have the biggest claim to fame in uh, having a more lightweight, direct approach to designing and implementing software. Um, some of these things can apply to other creative product endeavors, okay? Um, I've said in class just last week that I think that, for instance, Agile uh, has less applicability to things that you might call rollouts. You know, things we know how they're going to work, okay? But we have to get them into the hands of all the workers, okay? Do we need to do that in some sort of repetitive, agile process where, um, um, or, or do we just have to have an organized rollout? So things that are pretty well designed and settled and we just need to get pushed out to groups of people, I think have probably the least applicability of this kind of agile approach. Uh, and then they had these uh, 12 principles, okay? And I'll leave the principles here for you to read. They're in the book. But um, I would say, uh, I'll pick one or two. There are a couple here that are revolutionary and very much the new point of view that comes from Agile. And there are a couple that are just good project practices like for instance um uh deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter uh time scale well this is a new point of view okay uh um agile software development uh projects um they create very little paper and they create a lot of software. And in, in a lot of ways, that's good. And in some ways, that's bad. But this is revolutionary, okay? Uh, again, number seven, the same thing. Working software is a primary measure of uh, progress. This was a revolutionary idea. Um, okay, so now... Number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good 
uh, design enhances agility. You don't think that people before them were interested in uh, technical excellence and good design? I think they were. Okay. Um, okay, again, here. Build projects around motivated, motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Again, good waterfall projects had been doing this for years. How did these guys learn about this? Well, they were involved in good waterfall projects, right? So I'd say about half of these, or a little bit more than half, are part of this revolutionary, uh, agile point of view. And the other approximate half, maybe a little bit left, are just good practices that had been around in waterfall projects for years. And they've commandeered them and said that they're theirs. Now, all they're really saying is that they believe in them. But when you read the books and when you listen to the people talk, you would think they invented all this stuff. Okay, they invented a lot of good stuff, but a lot of these other things are just good practices that have been hanging around for, well, uh, they were hanging around before 2001. Okay. Uh, what's the Agile Mindset? So the, this uh, Gilp Rosa has the book, The Agile Mindset. Uh, emphasizes the need to focus on values, beliefs, and principles before following specific frameworks or processes. And I, I think to really understand what this argument is all about, um, it would help to have the, the kind of experience that I have. I mean, I got into IT projects in, uh, uh, let's see, 1978, 1970, no, 1976. Okay, and there was a point of view that people had that if you just had the right process and you had everybody do the right things in the right order, uh, that everything would turn out well. And the fact is that um, these big process uh, things kind of failed. Okay, so to the extent that the Agile people are saying, look, you need a, a core team of bright uh, people who really understand what they're doing and you need to give them responsibility and you need to get out of their way. Uh, having that as a reaction to the excesses of these big process uh, uh, approaches that were happening um, in the late 20th century, um, yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, and it really is an agile uh, value added. Um, so what's the difference between predictive, agile, and hybrid? So uh, the agile people always call this predictive approach, they call it waterfall. Okay, um, uh, so... Uh, let's talk about Agile first. Also called adaptive project management is used to describe an approach where the project scope cannot be well defined up front. Incremental releases are desired and changes are expected. And in fact, the Agile people uh, kind of say, we can't know the requirements for a product until we begin to experience it. Okay, so they think that this sort of iterative discovery-based approach is the only way to go about designing and implementing uh, software. The predictive approach, also called the waterfall or the traditional, their terms used to describe an approach where most of the project planning is done up front. There's a single final product, service, or result delivered at the end of the project. Change is constrained, not always constrained. Change is managed. Costs and risks are controlled and stakeholders involved at specific milestones. Okay, so again, um, the stakeholder engagement model for predictive projects or waterfall projects is uh, the, the stakeholders were involved in milestones. They, they had to sign off on things. 
uh, the term hybrid is used to describe a mixture or a combination of uh, predictive and agile approaches. And the fact is, <clears throat> if you pay a lot of attention to what the agile people uh, say about what real agile is, and it's pretty, you know, they're pretty constrained in what they'll consider real agile to be. Okay, if you went out and you and you went out in the world and you looked at what people claim to be agile projects, they're still using part of the predictive uh, approach. So, if you went at this scientifically, you would find out that most of the things that claim to be agile are actually some kind of hybrid. Uh, and here, a study finds most projects are hybrid. So in 2021, they looked at 477 projects in various industries. They found that 52% uh, of the projects could be categorized as using a hybrid approach. Project management approach was not associated with project performance in terms of meeting uh, scope, time, costs, and quality goals. Projects managed using agile and hybrid approaches significantly outperformed predictive approaches when it came to stakeholder success, measured as a combination of sponsor, client, and team satisfaction with the project. So these aspects of agile, where we're keeping the stakeholders involved in a closer in the day-to-day, uh, and in the creation of whatever we're building in a software sense, they seem to, at least according to this study, be leading, they seem to lead to happier stakeholders. Okay, and of course, we said that was one of the measures of success. Hybrid approaches were found to be similar in effectiveness to fully agile. Uh, approaches. Now, when you listen to the Agile folks, and again, we're reading a book in my class in which uh, the Leighton book, uh, they they want you to do Agile, Agile, Agile. They don't want you to borrow anything from the waterfall. Okay, but here, this is a study that said uh, hybrid approaches were found to be similar in effectiveness to fully Agile approaches. So res results uh, validate decisions by practitioners to combine agile and traditional uh, practices and suggest a hybrid is a leading project management approach. But don't ask the agile folks about that because they won't, they'll tell you that that's BS, okay? Um, Okay, there's some stuff here uh, towards the end of the chapter about the project management profession. Uh, I think that's important. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, so project program and portfolio managers need uh, a certain set of skills and they need to develop them over time. Uh, there are certifications. The certification that Kathy Schwabe is most involved with and the one that I've been most involved in is the one from uh, the PMI organization called PMP, Project Management Professional. There is another certification from PMI that uh, to get your PMP certification, you need to have a certain amount of time in the field. So. Uh, and we at the iSchool have quite a few students who have been in the field for a while and have come back to school. So potentially they could qualify for PMP certification. But there's another certification which is kind of a junior version of it um, that I'll point out in a minute. Uh, and uh, the chapter I work also covers uh, software tools. So let's see, skills that project managers should have. Well, they should understand all the stuff that's well documented in the PMI stuff. So the 10 project management knowledge areas, uh, the eight project performance uh, domains, all those things. Uh, you should understand the application area. 
okay? You should understand the project environment, the politics, the culture, uh, how to manage uh, change, uh, general business things, uh, financial management, strategic planning, things that you learn if you go to business this, this schools, and human relationship, leadership, motivation, communication, all those things. Those are all important for the project manager to either already know or to be uh, developing. Uh, PMI has uh, tried to promote this thing that they call the PMI talent triangle in which they say you need to combine technical project management skills with strategic and business management skills with leadership skills. And they uh, differentiate being a leader um, who focuses on long-term goals and big picture uh, objectives and they contrast that with being a, a manager who deals with the day-to-day uh, details of meeting specific uh, uh, goals. And being a, a PM takes some of both. Um, uh, additional skills pro program managers normally have experienced as project managers and they grow into managing multiple projects. Uh, portfolio managers have strong financial and analytical skills. Uh, maybe they took a lot of the kinds of courses that you learn when you go to business school. Um, we talk a lot about best practices, okay? And uh, a best practice is an optimal way recognized by industry to achieve a stated goal or objective. Um, and what are two best practices for project managers? So this guy, uh, Buttrick, he comes up with two ideas that I think are uh, good ones, you know, worth uh, uh, thinking uh, about. One is make sure your projects are driven by strategy, okay? So you as a project manager, you can get called into this before the project is uh a kicked off activity where you try to formulate a project, in which case it's important to think about how well aligned a particular version of a project would be with the strategy of the organization. Uh, the other thing is, even as a project manager who's been given a project, you ought to be very suspicious of projects that you're given that don't match the strategy of the organization because they're the the probability that they're going to be canceled is higher than other projects that match, okay? So maybe you want to be an advocate for steering your project so that it matches the organization's strategy uh, because that's a safer path to be on. And he says, engage your stakeholders. Ignoring stakeholders uh, often leads to project failure, okay? At the end of the project, I'd say the most important thing is happy people, okay? Uh, if you don't end the project with happy people, um, you're going to be considered to have f failed, right? So, um, you can meet the time and the, and the schedule and the budget. You can create a lot of value, but if you piss off the people, they're not gonna want you back, okay? If on the other hand, you please the people, okay? You, and I mean please in the ultimate sense, not just please them in some kind of a temporary sense. But if you leave happy people behind, they're more likely to excuse coming up short on other things, things like time and cost and, and uh, the scope and other things, if they feel that they were listened to and heard and have been treated well and have a good relationship with the PM and the project uh, team. 
So these two ideas, I think, are really good. Uh, project management certification. I'm not going to talk about this uh, much. There, there's a whole chapter on it. I think it's chapter 10. Um, if you're interested and want to talk about it some more, uh, come talk to me. Okay, I've been at PMP since 2005, so uh, that's coming up close to 20 years now. So I've been a long-term uh, believer in PMI and the certifications. But that's not primarily what this course is about. But if it's an interest of yours, I'd be glad to talk with you. Uh, and I think we're going to start right there. Oh, there is this thing. There, it, yeah, there is this certified associate in project management, this uh, CAPM. This is the credential that you could qualify for even if you don't have sufficient work experience to get the PMP. To get the PMP, you have to have something like 2,000 hours of work experience. It's pretty high. Oh, ethics. We ought to talk about that before we wrap up. So ethics are a set of principles that guide our decision making based on personal values of what is right and wrong. It's an important part of all professions. Project managers often face ethical uh, uh, dilemmas. Okay, and this is very true. This is true um, in the following ways. Uh, you'll get into situations where uh, you're trying to propose a project and somebody else claims that they can do it in half the time for half the cost. Uh, do you say, well, if they can do it in half the time and half the cost, I can do it too, even though you don't really believe it? Okay, so in a world where other people are lying or in a world where other people are not competent, um, you have to decide how you're going to behave. And it can be challenging, okay? It, uh, the PMI organization has a good code of ethics and some training on this that I think are useful, okay? But not only do we want to turn you out as a project manager, but we want to turn you out as an ethical one. Uh, project management careers, again, we talked about that in the beginning. I'm not going to say more about that now. Uh, project management software. We're going to talk about project management software to some extent in this course. Um, <clears throat> you guys are going to be doing uh, projects and you're welcome to use project management uh, software. Um, the trouble with project management software is that people come to see using project management software products as project management per se. And it's more the point of view and the thinking and the organization of information that really makes up project management. And the software is a convenient but incidental. Uh, and there are software products to, you know, to, to help with a traditional approach and there are software uh, products to help with the Agile approach. Um, and here are some outputs. Uh, the, one of the things that I think is interesting here is that this slide shows how you could use a product like Microsoft Project, which traditionally was a planning tool for waterfall approaches to project, how you can use it to help you manage an agile uh, a project. That's not something that I've done, but it's kind of nice to see them uh, getting into the Agile uh, game. Um, this is how you use a Microsoft Project to create a Gantt chart. This is the more traditional kind of a waterfall point of view. Uh, here's a product like uh, 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 Jira. Uh, this is from the Jira software uh, product to manage Agile. 
Yeah, there's just all kinds of things to use. And then we come to the summary, and I'll leave the summary for you to read on your own. So, um, uh, project management is a big topic, and we're going to cover it as uh, in an as inclusive a way as we possibly can. Uh, I like the Kathy Schwab book because I think it does a good uh, a job of bringing, uh, giving you a good world view. Okay. Um, I also like the Leighton book because I think it does a good job of explaining where the Agile folks are coming from and providing kind of more detail how to do things in a popular Agile way. So I'm going to leave you to all of this, and I look forward to discussing it in class. And I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.